Thank you, and I appreciate uh, all you guys sticking around. It's a Sunday at a conference, and I know the, usually it's time to get home, and so I appreciate you sticking around. Um, here's a little tip. If you're um, lactose intolerant, don't eat pizza the night before your talk. Just a thought. Woo. Um, and so I tried to relax this morning, and I thought, okay, I'm just going to take some Imodium. I'm going to relax. Turned on SpongeBob. And then SpongeBob went out of town to visit his grandma and left Gary with Patrick, and it was stressing me out. <laughs> Had to change the channel. <clears throat> so this talk is going to be a little different than something else, any other thing you may have experienced at, at a conference. Um, I want to start it off with a little bit of participation. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to talk. You're not going to have to say anything. Um, but I, I will ask you some, some questions. Um, and I want this to be, for this moment at least, by the way, is there a wireless clicker for this thing? I, I want this to be a safe space for honesty today. So as I'm asking some questions, this is a very important talk. And I don't, you saw the title here, Eating Our Own. And so I want to be able to demonstrate to you kind of what's going on in the broader sense. And in order to do that, I need you guys all to be honest, and I'll be honest with you. Is that cool? Can we do that? And if you see somebody, thank you, if you see somebody answer a question in a way that you wouldn't answer it, let's just not judge them, because we're doing this for purposes of the demonstration today. Um, I noticed a lot of people here, it's actually your first time at a conference. How many, by show of hands, how many people it's your first time at a conference? That is amazing. Give these folks a round of applause. Now, even though it's your first time at a conference, how many of those people who, are, who, who just wrote, only the people who, who raised your hands, the people who didn't, I know you know what I'm about to say. Those of you who, this is your first conference, how many of you have witnessed infighting online within the atheist community? Okay, basically all of you, I see, okay. So that's what this is about. And I really wanna open this up first by, like I said, having a safe space for honesty. Um, we can all pretty much agree, right, that anyone who's transgender should be able to go to whatever restroom fits them, right? Everybody agrees with that, I'm pretty sure, right? Okay. With that said, is there anyone here who feels a little bit uncomfortable if you're in a unisex public restroom. Not meaning that if someone trans walks in, I'm saying you are a man and a woman walks into the public men's restroom. Anyone makes you a little uncomfortable? <laughs> number one or number two. That's the point, you don't know. Anyone here, I'll, I'll tell you now, I'll put myself in the category and I'll tell you why. I put myself there because I'm afraid I'm gonna make the woman uncomfortable. I, I, when I'm in the restroom, and a lot of these conferences will do the unisex, bathroom, unisex bathrooms, and I get it, and it's supportive, and that's awesome, and I, I go in there, I do it, but I am a little uncomfortable, not because I'd, I feel like, oh no, this is weird. I'm always afraid I'm gonna make a woman feel uncomfortable. Plus, there's something weird being a guy just about being able to you know, take a shit next to a pair of high heels. <laughs> like, it's gotta be in our culture. Anyone here, raise your hand. Are you a little uncomfortable whenever you're in a restroom and they open it up for unisex restrooms. Anyone, anyone. Do me a favor, everyone that has your hand up, everyone who's willing, come right over here and stand up front. I'm serious, I'm serious, come on over. Come on over, please, I'm serious. Safe space for honesty, I'm serious. Anyone who's uncomfortable, I'm not gonna stand there because I have to be on stage, but consider me in this category. I would stand up and walk over here. Anyone else who wants to join them? This does not mean you are anti-trans. It means that you understand you might be a little uncomfortable in that situation. But out of all of you, do you still go to those restrooms? Even though you're uncomfortable, you still do it. Fantastic, I do the same thing. So that's the first one out of the way. Who here was a Hillary supporter from the very beginning? All of you come stand right over here. While they're doing that, who here was a Bernie supporter from the beginning? All of you go stand right there at the back by that red dolly thing. Because <laughs> there's so damn many of you, that's why. 
<laughs> All right, who here voted third party? You two right here? Come stand right out here. Right there is fine. Voted third party, okay. Who didn't vote at all? Come right over here. <laughs> Go right over there. All right there together. <laughs> okay, right there. All right, all right. This is why nobody likes you. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. All right. Who here was happy that the Nazi was punched on television? I saw one hand. Come on up. Come on up. Anybody want to give her some support? Anybody else here happy that the Nazi was punched on television? Come on right here. Right here in the middle. Anybody else? Anybody else? Don't get too close to the uh, people for the bathrooms. Let's separate it out a little bit. Guys, I'm going to have you slide down just a little bit. All right. <clears throat> now, who here, this is the last one, who here believes uh, that hate speech is still free speech? Wow. Okay. See how you're all split up into different areas of thought here? Everyone who believes hate speech is free speech, go right over there to that side. Yeah, this is crazy, huh? Look at this. Look at this. Incredible. And you don't? Yeah. Huh? You abstain. All right. And for everyone who didn't get involved at all, you're just apathetic. <laughs> right? Now, I want you to all to just look around at each other. You saw everything you just disagreed about, right? There are obviously some things that you do agree on. Now, staying where you are, I want you to know this is what we're doing to the movement. We're dividing and then rejoining, and dividing and rejoining. Now stay where you are, and I want you to answer these questions just by raising your hand, okay? Watch this. Raise your hand if you believe sex education should be science-based and medically accurate. <laughs> Raise your hand if you believe black lives do matter. Raise your hand if you believe being a police officer is a tough job. Look at this. Believe children should not be forced to pray in public schools. Believe that religious institutions should follow the same laws as the rest of us. Believe that citizens should have personal freedom and bodily autonomy. And believe transgender people should go to the bathroom of their choosing. Incredible. Now look, remember when you were all split up and look at the unity. Who here believes equality is a basic human right? Folks, these are the issues that affect our children and the future of our nation. And on a united front, we can be successful. Give yourselves a round of applause. You can return to your seats. <laughs> it's interesting seeing the things that divide us, the things that bring us together, and I guarantee you Almost everyone in the room went to that side when I said hate speech is free speech, right? That was my next point. It depends on how you define hate speech. Because even though you were all together on that side of the room, I could have started naming things. Do you think this falls under free speech? A hate speech? Do you think this falls under free speech? And I could start dividing you further. You all realize that, right? Even though you all said hate speech is free speech, everyone's going to have a different line. How many of you came out of religion? 
Okay, a fair number. Okay, interesting. Now think about this. Some of you left religion. Some of you became adults and never joined religion. And that's likely for the same reasons that those of us who left religion left. So why did we leave religion? Divisive language, hateful rhetoric, emotion ruled over facts, very misogynist, racist, loss of freedoms, the schisms, what church is better than the other church across the street, thought crimes, no diversity of opinion, if you disagree, you're ousted, you're treated differently. This is why most of us left religion. Is there anything about God belief in here? The things that we hate about religion may not be because of religion. Most of what we despise about religion is not the fault of religion itself, but are symptoms of the human condition. Or as Alex would say, the human condition. You, you, human condition, got it. What, what do I mean when I say recognizing the human condition? Human nature is very important. It's to fear what we don't understand, demonize those who we don't relate to, group think for security and belonging, identify enemies and speak for them, making their words uh, a lot more hateful than their actual views on a topic, marginalize the smaller groups for control, fight for power, and become the new oppressor. You think about, in, in human history, Stalin, Mao, Hitler, this is how it happens. Take over, make up your dialogue about what you think your enemy believes, Tell that dialogue over and over until it becomes reality for the majority. Use that power to oppress. That's the way it's worked. And the funny thing is that even though we have overcome the greatest cult imaginable, atheists are still at risk of religious thinking. And it has blown my mind, how can this happen? Well, we should have seen it coming. You're, you're most susceptible to something when you think you're immune from it. We leave religion or we recognize the problems of religion and we go, oh yeah, I'll never, that'll never happen to me again. I realize there's no God. I challenge the ultimate authority. It's impossible for me to be fooled again. And then we start behaving exactly like the religion we left. When I had you guys all split up into the groups, we were in person. So there were differences, we were smiling, we were making jokes, taking selfies. But if that had been online, half of you would be blocked. There would be hateful threads about you that you won't even ever see because the third party folks are talking about the Bernie folks and the Hillary people are blaming the Bernie people for Trump and everybody's blaming everybody who didn't vote. Everybody's throwing handfuls of shit across the aisle at each other and nothing's getting done except the destruction of our community. But because we're in person, we smiled, we took selfies and it wasn't so personal. Atheists are still at risk of religious thinking. Why? Well. We still demonize those we don't relate to, even other atheists. My political views are better than yours. You don't have the right kind of politics. We still engage in the group think for security and belonging. My atheist group is better than yours. I'm part of a humanist group. Oh, your group just gets together and drinks on Sundays? Wow, why don't you do something like clean up a highway, loser? I see it. I, I've seen groups split over that. It's almost like we're making that funny ass South Park episode come a reality. It's, it's, it's incredible to watch and it's, it's incredibly sad to watch. Fighting for power, trying to become the new oppressor, even if violence is necessary, there are people advocating for this. Now that we're in charge, you shut up, and if you don't, we'll punch you. 
And then we identify enemies and speak for them, just like the religious. How many of you have seen a Christian tell the atheist position and you cringed because they completely got it wrong? Everyone in here has experienced that. When you go, that's not even what we believe. That's not my position. And you're cringing because you'll see a million Christians going, yep, that's their problem. That's what's wrong with them. And you're going, they're speaking for us and they're demonizing us. And we're doing the same thing to each other. Here's a perfect example. I'm going to tell you a little bit of a personal story. Have you ever heard of this guy, Sean King? Black Lives Matter activist, Young Turks, very active on Twitter. He tweeted something. I follow him on Twitter. And he tweeted something about the statistics of unarmed black men being killed by police. And he had the statistics and he cited his source and I retweeted it. I went, this is great. Everyone needs to see this. I retweeted it. I probably got three or four very hateful comments, replies. Didn't realize you were a SJW snowflake. Because, I re because of who he is? I'm a, what? I, I, I'm trying to share the idea that is good. But because of where the idea came from, it's suddenly not as good? I shouldn't share it? Well, I was called a cop hater. I hate police officers because I retweeted Sean King. I one time made the mistake of saying Nazis are wrong and racist, but no one should be sucker punched. Guess what that got me called? Nazi sympathizer. So now I'm a SJW snowflake Nazi sympathizer, which is unique. <clears throat> Here's a tweet. Some of you may recognize the tweet. I've blocked off the name. I'm not here to demonize anyone individually. Um, but this tweet ended a friendship. The tweet says, so here's what happened at the very bottom, in case you can't see it. Dave Rubin tweeted out, he was gonna have someone on his show that was controversial, I don't remember who. But it says here, I'll defend this guy's right to free speech and share his bad ideas without getting punched in the face. These morons strengthen him. And this person, who was a very good friend of mine, tweeted this. He quoted the tweet, replied and said, I'm sure you can put some powder on it when you bring him on your show to suck his dick for two hours, fucking coward. I responded to this and I said, look, just like I did on dogmadebate.com when it was a forum in 2008, I replied and said, do you think this is the best way to change someone's mind? If, this, if Dave Rubin has a show and wants to do a show that that's an interview and doesn't push back, you know what you can do? You can not watch the show. Don't support him on Patreon. Don't be a part of that. Some shows are informational. Some are for debate. Some are for challenge. Pick what you want to watch. It's okay. And the really crazy thing about it is Dave Rubin is gay. But this guy felt like he was protecting other people. And it's so divisive. It's so... He's speaking for him and calling him a name all at the same time. I defended Dave Rubin's right to do that. And Dave Rubin got called a Nazi sympathizer. So I was then called a Nazi sympathizer sympathizer. I wrote a blog focused on nuance in which I had this quote. I said, black lives matter and cops have really tough jobs. I believe both of those statements to be true. I do, I do. And every individual person who says blue lives matter, I set them down that I've talked to personally and I go, do you believe black lives matter? They go, of course. Why are you drawing lines in the sand? Well, because they're saying Black Lives Matter. It sounds like they mean cops don't matter. I said, you know, I've talked to Black Lives Matter activists. I've been to Black Lives Matter meetings. Do you know what they're saying? They're saying Black Lives Matter too. And sometimes in our country, it doesn't seem that way. And they go, oh, that makes sense. On an individual level, we make progress. But then when they go online, it's Blue Lives Matter. And it's divisive because I got to show you what team I'm on. 
I said this statement, the sentence was in the blog, Black Lives Matter, cops have really tough jobs. Within four hours, this was a post on Facebook. David Smalley is attacking Black Lives Matter supporters. When I saw that comment, I went back and read my own blog. I was like, surely I made a mistake. Surely I did something wrong. You guys ever had one of these stickers on your car? We used to put those on our car in Texas um, to get out of tickets. Let's be honest. Um, well, if you have one, congratulations, you're now racist. Uh, that's just what it means now. Dan Dennett, uh, in his book, um, Intuition Pumps and Other Tools for Thinking, he talks about Rappaport's rules. And in Rappaport's rules, this is what it says. You should list any points of agreement, especially if they are not matters of general or widespread agreement. And then he says, you should mention anything you have learned from your target, so the person you're talking to. You mention, I learned this from you. Here are things we agree on. And you should attempt, and this is the most important thing I'm going to tell you this entire talk. You should attempt to re-express your target's position so clearly, vividly and fairly that your target says, thanks, I wish I'd thought of putting it that way. Only then are you permitted to say so much as a word or rebuttal of criticism. I refer to this as act of listening and worded it this way. Before forming an argument against someone, you should be able to restate their position in a way that they would agree. And this actually happened to me on my show when I had Dennis Prager in studio. We were going at it, we were talking over each other, and I was saying, I understand what you're saying. He's going, I don't think you do. I said, I, I get it, I, get it. I don't think you do. I don't think I, said, I think it. And then I just went, Dennis, can I try to explain your position? And he went, please. And then he let me talk. I explained his position back and he said, yeah, that's exactly what I meant. <laughs> and then we got to move on. He disagreed with my rebuttal and that's okay. But we, we didn't continue the blah, blah, blah. We understood each other. If you're not doing this simple task, you're very likely destroying relationships over straw men. You're not taking the time to say, let me make sure I understand your position. When we recognize nuance, false dichotomies are no longer a distraction. Things like black lives matter versus blue lives matter, Nazi punchers versus Nazi sympathizers, social justice warriors versus neocons, regressive left versus alt-right, feminism versus men's rights activists. You set these individual people down that you think is in one camp or the other, you're going to find nuance every time. So why do we eat our own? I believe it's our search for the perfect atheist. We're really good at finding holes in stuff. That's most of the way we became atheists. We analyzed religious doctrine. We talked to preachers. We found holes in their arguments and we went, nope, bullshit, 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 I'm out. <laughs> we all have different levels of that, right? But now we have the atheist community go, oh, this guy's pretty good. Where can I find his bullshit? Bullshit, 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 idiot. Bullshit, bullshit, racist. Michael Shermer wrote a book called Why People Believe Weird Things. And in there he's got a chapter called The Most Unlikely Cult. He's talking about the huge following of Ayn Rand and how that following dwindled to almost nothing near the end of her life due to the search for the perfect objectivist. If you haven't done the research on Ayn Rand, please do and understand what happened. Here's the short version. People were essentially disinvited to events and group meetings because they didn't share other values and were seen as flawed. Shermer writes that the problem arises when reason leads to an absolute certainty about one's beliefs such that those who are not for the group are against it. Because if you came to your position through reason and logic, it must be absolutely perfectly true. And then if someone disagrees with that, they must be anti-logic and reason. And that's how we've been using this. Are you a feminist? Yes. Would you like to come to a women's rights march? Absolutely. Here, hold this sign that says, kill your local rapist and wear this pussy hat. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, 
I don't think I want to do that. You fucking men rights activist, misogynist, son of a bitch. Well, no, I, I'm, I'm totally on board. If you disagree with any particular part of it, you're not suddenly anti the entire group's message. For objectivists, once a principle has been discovered through reason to be true, that's the end of the discussion. If you disagree with the principle, then your reasoning is flawed. And if your reasoning is flawed, it can be corrected if you come around to my way of thinking. But if you don't correct it, you remain flawed and do not belong in the group. And excommunication is the final step for such unreformed heretics. Three million copies of The God Delusion sold by Richard Dawkins. 10 million copies downloaded in Arabic. He told me on my show, three million of those were in Saudi Arabia. And he, admit, he said, I don't get paid for it. And I'm so happy they're doing it. They're downloading PDFs. He's brought more people out of dogmatic thinking than all of us combined. Imagine the contribution this man's made to the movement. He's not right about everything. Some of us may disagree with his views on Islam, his views on Down syndrome. He had a tweet about different types of rape. We may disagree with him on certain things, so guess what? You remain flawed and do not belong in the group. This guy. When I see this guy, I think philosopher, author, influential, intellectual. If you're really young, you may look at him and go, hey, that's a podcaster. That's fine. He's had some choice words. Uh, I think he said, Is, uh, Islam is the mother load of bad ideas. He's brought on some people who talked about a connection between race and IQ. He didn't challenge them the way a lot of people would have challenged him. So guess what? He's now racist, racist, racist. You remain flawed and do not belong in the group. Schirmer continues that the absurd lengths to which such thinking can go is demonstrated by Ayn Rand's pronounced judgments on her followers of even the most trivial things. Rand had argued, for example, that musical taste could not be objectively defined, yet, as Barbara Brandon observed and wrote in her book, quote, if one of her young friends responded as she did to a certain composer, she attached deep significance to their affinity. By contrast, if a friend did not respond as she did to a certain piece or composer, Rand left no doubt that she considered that person morally and psychologically reprehensible. Now you may be thinking, oh, just because they didn't like the same song. Here was the line of thinking. Brandon recalled an evening when a friend of Rand's remarked that he enjoyed the music of Richard Strauss. When he left at the end of the evening, Ein said in a reaction becoming increasingly typical, quote, now I understand why he and I can never be soulmates. The distance in our sense of life is too great. It becomes possible to see how a rational philosophy can become a cult. Sound familiar? Yeah, you're an atheist. But are you an atheist plus? Are you a Hillary atheist or a Bernie atheist? Or a dreaded third party atheist? Oh my God, are you a libertarian atheist? Yeah, you're an LGBT ally, but if you feel weird shitting next to a pair of high heels, you're clearly a bigot. Yeah, you acknowledge that Black Lives Matter and racism exists, but if you disagree with a single method used during a protest, now you're racist. Yeah, you disagree with Nazis, but if you say it's wrong to sucker punch one on TV, now you're a Nazi apologist. You remain flawed and do not belong in the group. And we're splintering to the point that we're becoming ineffective. Here's a, a pretty popular person in the atheist community posted this. Saying you are a sapiosexual is elitist, classist bullshit. A sapiosexual, for those who don't know, just means that you're attracted sexually to someone who is intellectual. You find being smart sexually attractive. Saying that you find people being smart, sexually attractive, is elitist, classist bullshit. And then the likes, the comments, a fight breaks out, people are blocked, friendships are ruined. I posted that um, 
throughout the election cycle and other things that happened, um, I don't believe the Democratic Party completely rep rec uh, represents my views as much as I thought they did. And so I said, I'm no longer a Democrat. I've said in other places, I, I consider myself a liberal independent. I may be a little more toward the center, but I lean left on a lot of issues, a lot of progressive issues. But I call myself an independent. I don't believe I'm a Democrat anymore. And uh, here's what happened on Facebook. Someone commented, no longer a Democrat? Yeah, he's trying to tap into that Dave Rubin audience and money, I guess. Republican, libertarian, just wondering what changed David's mind. He heard how profitable it is to denounce the left and act like a handful of whining college kids is, and Tumblr morons is ruining the country. I didn't say any of that. Identify enemies and speak for them, making their words more hateful than intended. No nuance, just assumptions, insults, and straw man. So you, sir, are a cop-hating, Nazi-sympathizing, elitist, classist, racist, SJW, left-wing, alt-right, libtard, neocon. You remain flawed and do not belong in the group. And if you even so much as take a picture with any of these people who have been controversial for anything, Facebook has a message for you. Fuck you! You believe you're purifying the movement. But you're only purifying your tiny piece of the pie and making it smaller and less effective at activism. You're taking your piece of the pie and going home. You're dismantling the free thinking that got you out of religion. Issuing divisive language, spotting hateful rhetoric, fallacy recognition, recognizing false dichotomies, avoiding straw man building, these are the things that you left religion for, yet many of us online are engaging the exact same behavior. And what's this causing? Reasonable people are becoming less public. No one wants to be the next mob attack victim. When they see the loud screechers attack someone for saying something nuanced, you go, oh, I don't want to get caught liking that. No one wants to be accused of being hateful to cops or minorities or women or the LGBT community. So you stop engaging. You post kitten pictures, <laughs> which are awesome, by the way. But you stop engaging in these major issues that matter because you don't want to be attacked. And public intellectuals are less likely to engage in social media, meaning respond to you, for a fear of being misinterpreted, spoken for, demonized, and attacked. So they just step away. And what does this mean? Well, that means the loudest, screeching, most unreasonable people get to build your narrative with divisive language, hateful rhetoric, straw men, and absolutely zero active listening. So how do we save it? I know, I'm, I know I'm out of time, and I'm gonna wrap it up, but how can we save it? Well, we openly talk about uncomfortable issues. We educate our interlocutor instead of attacking them. Calling someone a fucking asshole has never made them go, oh, maybe I should rethink my position. <laughs> We focus on dialectics, not debates. If you don't know what dialectics means, please look it up. And I say that because it'll be so much more effective when you read it. We stay skeptical of our own arguments, stay on the side of science. We embrace those who make mistakes and give them a chance to learn. We focus on strategic big picture goals and overlook differences where we can. I'm not telling you to co-mingle with people you find disgusting. I'm asking you to reconsider why you find them disgusting and make sure you fully understand their position. We respond to questions with answers instead of attacks for assumed motives. Sometimes just asking a question 
can get you demonized because people assume, oh, you're asking that question because you already assume the answer. Let's not do that to each other. Let's answer the question. Let them demonize themselves. If they're a demon, it's going to show. If they're disgusting, it's going to show. We don't have to apply it to them. And we practiced active listening and follow Rappaport's rules. If I can't restate your argument in a way that you're going to go, yes, that's my position, I'm not yet ready to argue with you. Simply put, we stick together because we are all we have. My friends within the black community have talked about division within the black community over what's the there's a different there's a uh, Israeli the Israeli blacks what's that yes the black Israelites division going if you're not a black Israelite you can't come to this barbecue that we're having for black Israelites to other black people and there are there there are reasonable people standing amongst these folks going listen the white people who are racist they see all of us as black they don't give a shit about you and you're dividing amongst yourselves. You need to stick together. When you go out into the world, they don't ask you if you're an Israelite. They see your blackness and judge you based on it. They all see you as black. Why are you differentiating within that movement? We can take a page from that book and understand the Christian nation looks at all of us as atheists. They look at us as the enemy. They don't give a damn if you're a Hillary atheist or a Bernie atheist or a third party atheist or a Nazi sympathizing atheist. They see you as an atheist and they see you as destructive. We stop searching for that perfect atheist. There isn't one. Alex is close, but there's not one. We refuse to become yet another unlikely cult. We stop allowing the screeching nonsense to control our narrative. We speak up reasonably and respectfully. We stop eating our allies and we stop eating our own. Thank you. Thank you.